We're going to look at the innkeeper today. We're going to start off our Christmas series on hope by, by looking at this fellow and see what his story is. My wife and I both grew up on Southern Gospel Quartet music. We just absolutely loved that. And when we were living in Tennessee, uh, one of our favorite groups was singing at a, a place two hours away from where we were in Johnson City. So we decided we were going to go. They were having a, a all-day-long dinner on the ground concert. I mean, it was, I mean, it was an all-day thing. Now, this is way before cell phones and way before the Internet. So we left the afternoon before. <coughs> we got there about 7 o'clock. Turns out the place we were going was just a pretty small little town right there at the edge of the Great Smoky Mountains. And we looked around for a motel, and the first one was full, completely full. We went to the second and only motel in the town. It was likewise completely full. And so we did what everybody our age would, would do. We slept in the car that night. <laughs> and I learned firsthand what the Bible really means when it says there was no room in the inn. A very familiar passage of Scripture. Share it with me. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Everyone went to his town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who had been pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. When they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. No room in the inn. Jesus comes to earth and he's born in a manger. First of all, we got to make sure we get that. What's a manger? <coughs> you know, we get this wrong all the time. We have manger scenes, and what it is, it's a beautiful little cabin with shepherds and wise men and, and giraffes and zebras and you know, cows and whatnot to put on your coffee table. And we say, there's our manger scene, and that's not exactly correct. A manger is the place that animals eat out of. It's like a trough. And they're nasty, in case you've never seen one up close and real. Because angels, angels, animals, well, I don't know about angels, but animals are kind of messy when they eat. And they snot a lot, you know what I'm saying? And so all over this hollowed out place to put feed in, you got animal bacteria and animal snot. It's just really nasty. And now I'm, I am sure Mary cleaned it up a little bit. What mother wouldn't? But get the picture. The Son of God is born in a feeding tray, in a barn full of animals. Now, this is the Messiah. This has been prophesied for thousands of years. This has been predicted by the great prophets of the Old Testament. This is the event that would se separate all of history into B.C. and A.D., I mean, the day today, 2021. <coughs> 2021 years since the birth of Jesus. Even our dating system is based on this. So I'm just saying it's the most important event in all of history, and there's no room. And I think the innkeeper just absolutely missed the biggest bonanza of his life. If Jesus had been born in his inn, he could have put up some of these big signs like you see in Vegas, Son of God born here. And you could rent the Son of God room for $129 a night and even get the free buffet thrown in. 
Now, that's probably the reason why God didn't let it happen that way. I'm just saying that the innkeeper missed the biggest blessing of his life. Because he said, maybe he even had to say, there's no room. Now, before we get too harsh on this guy, let's just remind ourselves that you do this. I do this. Our culture does this. We don't make room for Jesus. I mean, our culture really does seem seems determined to get Jesus out of the way. I don't want to talk about culture today. We are going to talk about it come January, I think. But today I just want to talk about why you and I ha have such difficulty making room for Jesus in our lives. And the three reasons, they're the same three that the innkeeper had. Here's number one. We fail to pay attention. We're just not tuned in. You know, we're not tuned in to God's presence in our life. Jesus comes into our lives every day, and we just don't see. It's like radio waves. It's like Wi-Fi signals. It's like TV waves. This room right now is full of them. Trust me, we have all sorts of these transmitters everywhere, and they are going through you right now, literally. But you can't see them. You can't feel them. But they're checking you out. <laughs> and if you had the right receiver, you could pick up a TV show. Or if you had a different kind of a receiver or a tuner, you could read your email or listen to Caleb. The point is, they're here. You never think about them. And as a result, you never use them because we're just not paying attention. We're not tuned in. <coughs> Common problem. In the Bible, people are constantly going up to Jesus and not knowing who he is. Classic one is on the, after the crucifixion and resurrection. Two guys are walking down a road to a place called Emmaus. And Jesus starts to walk with them. And these guys are just talking up a storm, and Jesus is just like pretending that he doesn't know what they're talking about. And the Scripture says they saw Jesus, but they didn't recognize him. So let's just bring this into focus. In Bethlehem, there is an inn. Inns are created to take care of the needs of travelers. There's no problem with the inn being there. The problem lies in the fact that it was already booked, that it was already filled with people. There was no vacancy. It was there, but they weren't available. Now, parallel that with your own heart. It's there. If you're here, it's beating and it's there. And your heart was made to hold God. You were created to have God inside of you. And until you understand that, you're really you're going to miss out on a lot of things in life. But what happens? <coughs> we start filling it with other things. <clears throat> we invite other guests into our, the room in our heart. We rent our hearts out to other things. And pretty soon there's no room for Jesus. It's filled with good things, great ideas, but other interests, other values, other loves, other commitments. We are not paying attention. We are not tuned into the very presence of the spiritual. Now, number two is kind of like that. We crowd our lives with stuff. Have you ever noticed that? How we accumulate stuff these days. It's not bad stuff, it's just stuff. Let me give you a profound truth. Stuff accumulates. There is something about a garage that overnight in the dark, stuff accumulates. I've tried to see it happen, but I've never succeeded. I just know that when I get up tomorrow and look in my garage, 
There'll be more stuff in it than today. We have TV shows now, ladies. You're the one who watches this because most of the men here just don't, won't do it. And those TV shows are about stuff. About how we all just have too much stuff. <laughs> oh. Your heart was made for God. We've said that already. They, we said that's the purpose of your heart. It wasn't made to hold all the extra stuff that we've already put into it. And because it's already in there, there's not a whole lot of room for anything else to come in. <clears throat> and so you wind up overbooking your own life. Now you say, well, why is this such a bad thing? And, and the answer is, is that God wants to give all of us good gifts. The uh, Bible's full of these things that God has, from the beginning of time, wanted to give His children. Relational gifts, uh, or oh, emotional gifts, spiritual gifts, financial even, health gifts. I mean, God really likes to bless His people. The problem is, you can miss that. God is not a God who just simply gives it whether you want it or not. He wants you to love Him by faith, not by some fear or force. You know the theology, we're not puppets on a string. We all have the free will to decide. Well, God wants it to happen that way. He wants us to make room for Him. And when, uh, you know, the problem is, is that most of the time we just simply say, God, I don't mean anything disrespectful. But I've got my own life to live. I've got other things to do. I want to go my way. And if I get a chance to come around, you know, then I'll, I know you'll be there for me. So how's that going for you if you're living that way? My guess is probably not going all that good. It's one of the reasons why lives are broken and relationships are broken and health is also broken. You just miss the great things that God wants to give simply because we have too much of this stuff in our unattentive hearts. The Bible says in Corinthians, the unspiritual person has no room for the gifts of God. He can't even recognize them. And Jesus even describes this kind of a lifestyle, this overbook way of living. They are overwhelmed with worries about all the things they have to do and all the things they want to get. And the stress strangles what they've heard, and nothing comes of it. By the way, that's why people who go to church all their lives can go home and still not be changed. They come to church, they hear the truth. They say, yeah, I get that. I need to do that. But once church is over, they go back home to their overbooked, overstressed kind of living. And they forget what they had even thought about earlier. And again, I am not talking about bad things or evil things. I'm just assuming that if you're coming to church, you're stop that. I'm talking about good things. And what I've discovered is that if Satan can't make you bad, he will make you busy. Because either way works to the ultimate end. As a pastor, if I could give you any kind of a Christmas gift to everyone, it wouldn't be money, although money would be really helpful. It wouldn't for that you become famous or, or even have all the fun in life. I would just wish that you would come to know your Creator as the God of your present and the God of your future and live with Him forever. Why do we stress that so much in the church? It's common sense. Your career isn't going anywhere past this lifetime. Your hobbies are not going anywhere past this lifetime. Your bank account is not going anywhere past this lifetime. <coughs> the only thing that goes beyond this lifetime is your relationship with God. The Bible says make sure you don't become so full of yourself and your stuff that you forget God, your God. Well, third reason that we don't seem to make a lot of room for Jesus is because 
Unfortunately, ultimately, some people think it's not necessary. We have this sense of self-sufficiency sufficiency that says, <coughs> I'm doing just fine on my own. Well, maybe you are. That's a, there's a chance that this is exactly what the innkeeper thought. He could have said, why do I need any more guests tonight? Sorry, no room. I'm already sold out. I made my bundle for the night. I bankrolled it. That's all I can get in one night, so why, why should I worry about you? A lot of people, if that was the innkeeper's attitude, a lot of people still have it. And Jesus, I'm still making money. I'm living the good life. I'm doing the things that I have set out to do all my life. And I'm just not sure that you have anything to offer me. There's a kind of arrogance to that. I think it takes maybe a little age and maturity to see how arrogant that really is. It kind of reminds you of Psalms chapter 10. It says people are too proud to seek God. They don't look for Him. And there's no room for God in their thoughts. Now you do have a God, even if you live like this. Your God is whatever you love to do. For you, it might be your career, it might be your finances, it might be your family. But whatever you enjoy doing, that might become your God very easily. The only problem, again, with that is that when you're disconnected from God, you're living on your own power. You're, you're disconnected from the power. Half of my house right now has no electricity. We are running extension cords from downstairs to upstairs into the garage and into the other various parts of the house. Now, yes, we got electrician coming. And, you know, put that on your prayer list too, that sooner or later he will come. But let me tell you a fact of living like this for about three, four weeks now. Appliances are worthless without electricity. I have a toaster that's just absolutely worthless. It did not get blessed with an extension cord. I have a blender that is absolutely worthless. Didn't make the list. And a vacuum cleaner that didn't make it to the extension cord is a piece of chunk, a waste of whatever. They have no value unless they are plugged into the power. And I hate to draw an application like that, but it's true. Our lives are just as quirky and useless without the power that we all need to really survive. That it just begs to ask, why, why don't we see this? Why don't we understand this? We're just not going to fulfill our purpose without the power. Now, good news. I've given you three parts bad news, so you do need some good news. <clears throat> the good news is this. If I do start making room for Jesus in my life, there's tons of great blessings we get. I just want to give you two because I know we have to draw it down together. Number one, the first blessing is to know my Creator and my Savior. His name is Jesus. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, by the way, which is just the title for Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He was in the beginning with God. But through Him, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that was been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So yeah, that's a tremendous blessing. I really want to know the Creator. I really want to know the Savior. Again, maybe some theology you're not aware of, but Jesus created me. Jesus created you. He, he is the one created the planet. He's the one created the sun, moon, and stars. The Bible says He not only creates it, He holds it together in His palm of His hand. But He didn't just create it. He is the one who offers this salvation we've, we've talked about for so long. Because we've all messed up. I think that's pretty common knowledge. 
I don't measure up to my own standards, let alone to God's standards. I don't know anyone on this planet who's perfect. I've never met anybody on this planet who has truthfully said, I am perfect. In fact, if you're here today and you think you're perfect, I have only one solution for you. Get married. <laughs> All right. Had to do that. But the truth is, marriage is not a problem. But marriage reveals the truth. I, I don't know if you ever heard it, but we preachers have a little joke that before marriage, opposites attract. But after marriage, opposites attack. So if you think you're perfect, just ask your spouse on the way home. Okay? <laughs> We're just not perfect. But that is okay because that's the grand plan that in the midst of our imperfections, Jesus has made a way for us to become a child of God. The verse there on the screen says, The true light, this Jesus that gives light to everyone is coming into the world. And to all who receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And that is a special privilege. And you say, well, hold it, Pastor. Isn't everybody God's son and daughter? Isn't God the father of everybody? And the short answer to that is no. No, he's not. Now, God created everybody. God loves everybody. God has a purpose for everybody. God wants all people to be saved. But he does not become your father until you are adopted into his family. And the only way to come into the family of God, you know it is to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ. We talk about it every, every week. And it's a good thing to talk about it. Just don't forget it. This relationship we have is based on believing and obedience to the ways of Jesus. All right, the second reason, because I told you I was only going to give you two. The first is I get to know my Savior, my Creator. I would just love to know how He did it and how it all holds together. And, you know, that's just me. The second reason, I get some benefits now. <coughs> Briefly, purpose, peace, and power. We get those things. Now, I mean, I can truly tell you that without the power, a lot of your life is just not going to work. And, you know, we're, we weren't made for money. We were made for meaning. Uh, we weren't made for success. Success is wonderful. It's a worthy goal. But we were made for significance. We were all made to know that we matter. Our lives are important and we affect others in positive ways and and we represent the truth that is eternal and i mean god has always planned it that way call it purpose whatever but that's a very sports important sense and beyond purpose peace uh, scripture says i'm leaving you with a gift peace of mind and the peace i give is the gift the world can give so don't be troubled don't be afraid you know, the world's not real good when it comes to peace. I read just this week that in the past 300 years, uh, humanity has made 260 major peace treaties. Guess how many of them we've kept? Virtually none. Maybe one or two. World's peace is very tenuous. Everything has to be going okay. And then you might have a few days, weeks, years of peace. Jesus says, I got a peace for you that lasts in the middle of chaos. I have a peace for you when everything else is not working at all in your life. The Bible calls it the peace that passes understanding. You can't figure it out, but it's still there. And as Paul writes, God did not give us a spirit that made us afraid. He gave us a spirit of power, love, and self-control. Follow me on this, and we'll just tie this first part together. The fact that there was no room in the end didn't stop God's plan. The Messiah still came. And when the innkeeper said there's no room, 
He didn't hurt God's feelings or God's plan. He only hurt himself. He really truly missed the biggest blessing in his life. And in all fairness, even if it wasn't his fault, he still missed the privilege of housing the Son of God. So just remember, as we start this month out, Christmas is about making room for Jesus. It is just that simple. And if you miss this, you're going to really miss it all. You will have missed completely the meaning of Christmas and why Jesus came unless you make room for Jesus in your life. Second, just be careful. Be careful of busyness in your time, in your schedules, in everything. And take that extra time. Slow down, what the Bible would say in one place. Slow down, smell the roses, take some time to commune with God. And just think about this whole thing. Who is God to you? Come on up, guys and gals, ladies. Share a beautiful song.